Let me begin tonight just by sharing with you from the heart. And uh, what I mean by from the heart, um, you know, I mean, my stuff isn't scripted anyway, because, um, you know, I just find the Holy Spirit uh, uh, has room when you when you give him room. It is more and more difficult from what I'm seeing. It is more and more difficult to not only be a Christian in the society and the culture in which we live, but just as a Christian to know what to believe. Um, it seems like the sources of information uh, that we have access to are becoming very blurred. And what I mean by that is everywhere you go, there's a blurring of the lines between what it means to be a Christian and what God said, and then what our culture says. And a lot of that is creeping more and more into the churches that we all attend. So tonight I want to talk about the message that Jesus gave about where uh, sin, where um, envy, where strife, where confusion, where all those things are generated as opposed to where those things are seen. And so I want to start by showing you something, and, and some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not, um, but I want to start, and I want to mention this, that I'm going to be showing you a couple of um, video clips tonight. And I want to start by saying that I'm showing you this so you understand. This is not about criticizing people, okay? Um, Jesus says that he did not come to condemn the world. And so as Christians, it is not our job to condemn other people that may or may not be doing something we don't agree with. But it is important for us to observe and understand what is going on. So that forms the basis of this first bit. So I want to show you there's a church in, um, it's in Tulsa in, in America, in Oklahoma. And it's a, it's, a, it's a very big church. It's called Transformation Church. Um, some of you guys might know or might have heard about it. And it's a big church, right? And um, one, of the, one of the things that they say on their website is that they are a relevant and progressive church, okay? Now, um, some of you might know uh, about this church. Let me show you a little bit, just a short clip from their Easter production, okay? So this is Easter production. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Now I've got an ad. <laughs> One of the negatives of YouTube. All right, so um, that's that's uh, that's a quick clip from the Easter service. Now, here's the thing, right? Young people and 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 older people are always going to have a divide, okay? And I remember growing up, you know, like my parents would be like, "Oh, the movie you guys listen to, the, the music you guys listen to, and the movies you watch, they're just rubbish." Back in my day, they had real movies. Back in my day, they had real music, you know, and they'd crank out the ABBA and, you know, whatever else, uh, the Beatles, and, you know, and here we are listening to electro dance music and things like that, okay? And so I understand and I recognize that there is a difference in culture and there is a difference in kind of what's cool and what's not and what's acceptable and what's not. And 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 I, I fully get that, okay? So please please don't misunderstand that that I do get that. But there is also a difference between what promotes a Christian message that is based on the Bible versus what tries to fit in with society and suit the culture. And, you know, I was given this example. It's quite interesting, but I was given this example uh, when I was in youth group uh, as a kid. And uh, uh, I remember talking to the, the pastor and he was talking to us about, you know, we, we were saying, well, if we hang out with bad friends, if we hang out with bad people that sin and, you know, kind of do the wrong thing, maybe we can win them over to Christ. And he did this thing with us. What he did, he, he got he got us to stand on a table. So imagine like if this, if my phone is a, is a table, he got us to stand on the table and someone else was standing down, you know, on the ground. And he said, all right, I want you as a Christian, I want you to put your hand down and reach out to them. And I want you to pull them up onto the table. And at the same time, I want them from the ground position to pull you down towards the ground. And we could never pull the person up, but the other person could always pull us down. And the reason why they could pull us down was because gravity was working in their favor. 
right? And in, and in many ways, also, it's a, although it's a kind of funny example, in many ways, that's how the Christian life is. There is a natural gravitational pull towards sin, towards doing our own thing, towards being away from God, because we live in a fallen world. And what's happened is for a lot of the church, a lot of the church has looked around and said, well, how do I be relevant to this generation? How do I get people to even come to church to begin with? How do I get them to care about God? How do I care them to be, get them to be interested in what we've got to say? So we have to look like them. If we look like them, then they come in. And when they come in, then we can pull them up. And that's a fundamental misunderstanding about what it is that changes people's hearts. What changes people's hearts is not feeling like they're accepted. It's not feeling like they're normal. It's not feeling like they're good the way they are. What changes people's hearts is when they come to the end of themselves and they realize that they need a savior. And you don't do that through bashing people. You do it through showing them God's love. But what a lot of people have done, a lot of evangelists, ministers, churches, is they've gone to the place where they're like, well, if I can just get people through the door, it doesn't matter how. If I can just get people to come, it doesn't matter what I'm teaching as long as they're sitting in church because the message has all been about just get them to church, get them to church. Um, and it fundamentally misses the message of a transformed life and of a renewal of the mind. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because Jesus didn't just come to tell us to renew our minds from the Old Testament to the New, but also came to tell us to renew our minds from us trusting in ourselves versus to us trusting in him. And the importance of knowing the difference between what is the world's way of doing things versus what is God's way of doing things. And I want to show you what the genesis is, I believe, of, of something like this. When you see a church... And again, I'm not criticizing this guy. I don't know him. I don't know very much about him. I know that their church is big. I know they have a lot of attendees. They have a lot of followers. And, and, and I'm just, just from what I've seen, uh, I want to show you a, a clip. It'll take maybe two minutes. But this was a controversial clip, and you'll see why. And again, just so you understand, my heart goes out to this guy. I'm not criticizing him. But my heart goes out to him because he's a young guy, and he's in charge of a large church, and he's in a culture that is anti or different to what he's used to, and he doesn't know what to do. So let me show you um, a quick message that he shared. It's a much bigger uh, message, but I've listened to it in context to get a, get a sense of, of what he's talking about. I'm hoping there's not, not another ad, but if there is, you know, we'll skip through it. But I just want you to listen for a few minutes, okay? This is important. I'm trying to decide right now, Cordell, how much I'm going to get him to try to God decided male and female. No, no, no. I'm not. This is not a bad. I need y'all to hear my heart on this. This is not a bashing. This is not a. He, if I was there, maybe I would have told him, is there something in the middle you could do? Like kind of a, like a little maybe if somebody. Well, I was born like this. I don't know how I feel. I feel you. And I wish that there was an option of other in the kingdom. In culture, you can make up whatever you want to. In culture, you can build whatever you want to. But the truth of the matter is that if we are going to submit under what the king said, I'm going to have to wrestle with what I don't even fully understand. God, pastors don't say this because they want to be absolute. Well, why did that? I don't freaking know. No, honestly, I wish God would have made it so much simpler and it was like A, B, C, or D, like frick. No, serious. So pastor, like, so what do you think about gay I don't know. But I do know in the kingdom, They're going to cast me. All right, I'm going to stop it there. So you see, um, he's talking about basically two issues. He's talking about the homosexuality issue and he's talking about the transgender issue. And, and what he's trying to get at, he's like, if I was there with God, maybe there would be a, a middle gender. Maybe there would be some other options at A, B, C, or D, but God made them just this way and that way. And, and don't blame me. It's not my fault. And I don't even get it. 
And I understand that it's difficult, right? So what he's doing is he's saying, I'm on your side. If you feel like there's a problem, if you feel different, I'm on your side. And see, this is the challenge. When we're trying to be on people's sides, we're actually siding with them instead of siding with God. I'm going to show you a little bit more. And just listen to the words. It's so important. Understand that this, just this YouTube channel has 1.9, almost 2 million subscribers. It's a huge channel and it's a huge church. And this is the lead pastor. And again, please hear my heart. I'm not criticizing, but just listen. I'm not the king. Just listen to the Why you're wrestling like that, and I don't know what to do to help you but to stand with you, pray with you, and not, and you're welcome at Transformation Church. Brands is in the title, Transformation. You can be here. Oh, well, trans is in the title, you can be here, right? Um. No, that's not how this works, right? And you see, his, his thing is, I don't know why God made it this way. I don't know. I have no answer for you. I don't know why it's this way, but I can stand with you and I can pray with you. Pray with you what? Stand with you on what? You see, the challenge we have is that we're in a culture that says that certain things are okay, that the Bible says is not okay. And when you have tons of people coming to your church that support you financially, that make the difference between you having a job and not having a job, that make the difference between you being able to open your doors next week and not being able to open them, you have to say what suits the crowd. And that's why you, you as the lead pastor of a major church are going to say things like, trans is in the title, you're welcome here. And again, I'm not... I'm not against people. Jesus was not against people. But what I'm saying is, do you imagine if you are someone that attends this church, this is the doctrine that you're getting from your lead pastor. And he is not some old fuddy-duddy sort of pastor that's, you know, out of touch. He, this guy, I mean, this is a good looking guy. He's very charismatic. You know, he's dressed nicely, you know, for the culture. He's got a lot of influence. He's got money. And people are listening to him. And if you're a young person and you're walking away from this church, what are you going to think? How unfair that God has made people a certain way in these in-between categories, and now they have to deal with it. And the pastor has no idea why God made him that way, and the pastor doesn't know what to do about it, but we can all pray for this person. It's going to show you a little bit more, and then that'll be it. But again, I just want you to listen and put yourself in the position of attending this church. And this is not in any way, shape, or form, uh, uh, something that's unusual. This message is being preached in lots of churches. You have your lot here. What do you hear? Will I marry you? I can't. Not because I don't think you found love. Just as a kingdom ambassador, when I look back at the orders that are in the constitution of the kingdom, I know people don't talk like this because they want it to be black and white, but there's some things on this earth I don't have the answers to. And so when I don't know, I just default. All right. So notice in his mind is like, I can't tell you you haven't found love if you decided that you want to marry someone of the same sex. I can't marry you because unfortunately this God that's mean has made the rules this way. And as an ambassador, I have to come under what he's told me to do. But, but I believe you found love. No, they haven't found love because love is not a feeling, right? Love is not a feeling. What is love? The Bible tells us what the biblical definition of love is. And it has zero to do with how you feel. So imagine you're in a position of influence. You've got these people coming to your church and they're asking you questions. And now you've got to think about what all the different followers on YouTube are going to think. You're going to have to worry about what the TikTok people are going to think. You have to worry about what the media is going to think. You have to worry about, you don't even know who's in your crowd. You could have a reporter that's in your crowd that's going to report things. 
And we all know the media is biased and, 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 you know, reports on things unfairly. My point is this, this guy is so confused and so conflicted because on the one hand, he has to obey God in whatever understanding of the Bible he has. But on the other hand, he's got a culture that he has to conform to. And he's in between what God teaches and what the culture says is good. And he's trying to please both. And you can't serve God and mammon or money or anything else. You have to choose. And everything Jesus said was countercultural. And, and the sad thing for this guy is he must be incredibly conflicted because on stage you have to look a certain way. But when you're reading your Bible and it's just you and the Lord and the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart, what do you do with that? Because the Holy Spirit's not confused. The Holy Spirit knows exactly why God made the male and female. The Holy Spirit has already told us and the Bible tells us why God made it the way that he did. It's not confusing. He's like, it's so confusing. It's not confusing. I wish some things weren't black and white. You know, things aren't black and white. Yes, they are. They're very black and white. In some of these areas, the Bible is very black and white. And you know, people don't like that because they want to make room for what suits them. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you this tonight because I think you need to, more than ever before, I think you need to guard your heart and guard your eyes. Because if you could be in a church that has 2 million subscribers, do you realize the reach of that church? So not just the people showing up on a Sunday, but the reach out there. And this guy writes books. And again, please hear me. I'm not criticizing him as the man. But what I'm saying is that him as a Bible teacher, as the leader of that church, if he can't answer the basic questions of why God made men and women, of why two homosexuals in a relationship is not someone finding love, then that's a problem. Because as a pastor, you have to be able to answer those questions. Otherwise, you're going to do what he did, which is, it's not my fault. This guy, God, has made these rules. I don't know why he's made those rules. And I feel sorry for you, but I kind of have to side with him because he's the boss. right? Even just the way he said, this is the constitution. He's basically putting it all on God. If you're an ambassador, you know, what he said, he said, I'm an ambassador. An ambassador doesn't make apologies for the country or the person that he's representing. The ambassador doesn't come before the ambassador from like, say Russia, right? Russia and Ukraine have this conflict that's been going on for over a year now. When you listen to the Russian ambassador anywhere in the world, there was a 60 minutes interview recently uh, with the Russian ambassador to Australia. I've heard other Russian ambassadors. When they come on, oftentimes the reporters will say to them, you know, well, why is your country doing this? And why is your country doing that? Russia's invading and you guys are bad and so on. I've never seen the ambassador get on the news with the reporter and say, look, I know what you're saying, but I kind of have to submit to the country. And I don't know why we're attacking that country. And I, no, they're like, because we think we're right. We're doing the right thing, and, right? Because you're an ambassador. You are there to represent the interests of that country. And you need to understand the reason that country is doing what it's doing. And even if you personally don't necessarily agree with the country, you represent it as though you do. That's what an ambassador is. And yet, the ambassador of the church in this situation says, I don't know why God did what he did and kind of doesn't make sense to me. And if I was there, I mean, the arrogance to say, if I was there, I would have said, is there another option, God? Like God didn't think of, you know, C and D. He just went A and B, male and female. And yeah, if God did, had enough time, if he wasn't running late for that meeting, he would have did C and D. And look, here's the thing. I'm not against this guy again, because what's the point of being against him? But I'm saying that if you don't know your Bible, if you don't guard your heart, you will hear messages like this time and time and time again. And you're going to end up believing that what someone says is, is not only more correct, but more fair than what God put in place. And see, this is the trouble. If you have these challenges in your life, you're going to think, well, God made me that way. And you know, only if this pastor was with God, he would have given me another option. But now I've got to sit here and suffer in silence. And you can watch the whole clip. I'm not going to go through all of it because there's no point. But, but you can watch the whole clip for yourself and see it in context. And he talks more about it and how his heart hurts that these people are dealing with. It. And he doesn't know why they're born this way and why you know God made them this way. And it's because he's stuck in this culture that says one thing and he's seen a Bible that says, says something else. And people are fickle, right? Right now, we have 32 people on this call right? Or 32 uh, individual participants, maybe there's 40 people, 45 people, right? And we meet, we, we meet week in, week out, and we do a ton of Bible study. And that's it. That's who shows up, right? Those other guys, they preach a different message and a different gospel, and there's 2 million people on their YouTube channel alone. 
It is supposed to be this way. We specific, you have to understand something. We deliberately don't advertise our group. We don't try and grow it. We're not trying to have a thousand people. We're thankful for everyone that supports us because you're the few. You're the few that are doing and want to do what we're talking about. Because, you know, Jesus, it says that the masses followed Jesus, but it says that he did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in their hearts. And Jesus knew that when the going gets tough, that when things get a little bit confrontational, everyone's going to leave him. And you look at Peter, right? Peter was with Jesus. Peter got the revelation that Jesus was the son of God. And, and, and Jesus himself says, on this revelation, on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And yet Peter denies Jesus three times when the going gets tough. And so the challenge is, brothers and sisters, we've got to guard our hearts. And so I want to start uh, by sharing with you the first verse here. I think it's really, really important. It says in Matthew 6, verse 22. And we've read this before, but man, do we need to keep reminding ourselves of it. The lamp of the body is the eye. The lamp of the body is the eye. In other words, for the body to know where it's going, the eye is the one that directs it. It says, therefore, if your eye is good, Another translation says, if your eye is single, but if your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. In other words, if the way you perceive things, if the, the glasses that you look through are full of light, then your body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, if your eye perceives things the wrong way, your whole body will be full of darkness. Why? It says, if therefore the light that is, that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, if your eye, which is the one that's supposed to direct you, which is the one that filters everything that you see, if it's the one that guards you and sends you on your way, if that eye is darkness, then everything that you put in you will be darkness. And so then how great is that darkness? In other words, uh, if you remember a while ago, I won't do it now, but I did an example of, you know, with, with a glass of water. And in that glass of water, I had a little bit of dye. And it was like blue dye or purple dye. And, you know, a lot of Christians, when they're trying to deal with, when they're trying to deal with sin in their life or with, with addictions or with whatever else they're dealing with, it really comes down to renewing your mind. What they're trying to do is try to scoop that dye out, you know, to get it out. And the problem with trying to scoop dye is the dye just mixes with the rest of the water and colors all the water. What you need to do is pour in the word and pour in uh, what God says about your situation. And as you pour in fresh, clean water, all of that dye comes out. And eventually you've got a clean cup and you didn't have to go fishing in it, right? And, and so what this verse is saying is if your eye is good, in other words, if you're adding in clean water, then you'll be clean. But if your eye is bad, if you've got dirty water and you're just adding in more dirty water, then how dirty will that water be? Because it just, just gets dirtier and dirtier and dirtier. And so for us as Christians, we've got to be so careful what we put into our hearts and into our minds. Because if our eye is looking at the wrong things, then we're going to be conflicted because the world is definitely not going to tell us what God says. And to a large degree, now churches are also doing what they want, not what God wants. Churches are succumbing to the situation that we've just seen, which is I've got to now be relevant and progressive. Why do I have to be relevant and progressive? Because if I'm not relevant, people won't listen to my message. And if I'm not progressive, people won't accept my message. But you know, Jesus wasn't relevant or progressive. Shock. Think about it. How was Jesus relevant? I and mean, most people don't think about this, but imagine Carpenter's son shows up, right? In modern, modern, for them, modern, modern Israel. They've got the Ten Commandments. They've been living under the law for hundreds of years. Jesus comes in and says, I've got a different way. Completely irrelevant. Not relevant. Not relevant. Because from Jesus's perspective, he's not telling them something they want to hear. It is not relevant to them. They don't want it. They're not interested in his message, right? And then progressive, and what we mean by progressive in our common culture means more towards the left, more towards, you know, personal freedoms to do whatever you want. And Jesus is not progressive. He's conservative. He's restrictive, right? Because the Jews come and say, well, you know, adultery is when you sleep with someone that's not your spouse. And Jesus says, no, 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 adultery is what you do in your heart. When you look at someone lustfully, you've committed adultery in your heart. That's not progressive. That's more conservative. That's more restrictive. Because Jesus wasn't interested in being relevant and being progressive. He wasn't trying to get people to like him. Jesus was countercultural. And as Christians, he tells us, hey, by the way, if you follow me, people are going to have a problem with you because you're countercultural. 
Now, some Christians have figured out that the best way to do that is to be offensive and rude and mean. That is not the way to be a Christian. That does not represent Jesus. You don't see Jesus criticizing the people that he ministers to that were in sin. I mean, there's lots of times when Jesus comes across, we won't talk about that tonight, but we will in the coming weeks, when Jesus comes across people that were in sin. And he doesn't call them bad people or whatever. He tells them, don't do it. He tells them sometimes the effects of it, but he still has compassion and mercy on them because he knows they're lost. He's not there to hurt people and and make them feel bad. And unfortunately, Christians have given Christ a bad name by representing him poorly in this area. So on the one hand, people have just been really mean and, 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 and terrible, you know, and treated people poorly. But on the other hand, you know, they've gone the other way, which is they're just siding with people and telling people that everything's great and God loves you no matter what. And, you know, you get messages like trans is in the name, you're welcome here. And again, I'm saying, you know, welcome people into the church that, that, that want to come. But by saying that we have it in the name, therefore, it's an option. It's not an option. You know, you need help, you know, and we love you and we want to help you. It's not about criticism, but we've got to get real about this thing, guys. We've got to get, we've got to get real about this gospel. Are we going to actually believe what the Bible says? And are we going to live that out? Are we just going to pay it lip service? And this is the challenge. Where do you get good teaching? Good biblical teaching. And I'm not saying it sounds self-serving because I'm talking about this while you're talking about yourself. Yeah, I'm talking about myself. This is good teaching. But it's not just me. It's where else? What are the books you read? What are the videos you watch? What are the sermons you listen to? Many of you attend other churches. I hope you're in a good church. For those of you that are going to churches, I hope you're reading the right stuff. Because it says that if your eye is good, then your whole body will be good. But what you put into your eyes will make the difference. Let me show you. 2 Timothy 4, you know, the Bible warns us. 2 Timothy 4 says, uh, verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. What does that mean? Be ready in season and out of season. In other words, be ready at all times. There's no time to be a Christian. You are representing Jesus at all times. And look at this in the blue, right next to it. Convince rebuke exhort with long suffering and teaching convince rebuke exhort with all long suffering and teaching how many how many churches are trying to convince rebuke and exhort versus accept and condone and be progressive and and, and, and relevant we're supposed to say hey what you're doing is not working for you Again, in the right way and in the right context, with long suffering, with love, the motivation has to be love. It's not angry. It's not anger. We're not angry at people. People are hurting. And that's what, honestly, when I watch that pastor, I'm not angry at him. I'm hurt. For, honestly, my heart breaks for him because can you imagine how difficult it must be for him? How difficult it must be for him to get up every week and know that there's a conflict in his heart. And a lot of pastors know what the truth is but they're afraid to teach it because of the cost of doing so. And that's why Jesus says, before you worry about ministry, before you worry about building a church, before you worry about influence, right? We talked about this. Jesus says what? If you're going to be my disciple, you need to die to yourself. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. Count the cost. There is a cost to discipleship. And so many people, they get into a position of authority and a position of leadership and a position of influence. And at that point, they have to make a choice between losing some of the influence or all of the influence, losing that position in order to follow him. And and many, many people choose to to go the other way. They're not willing to lose their position. They're not willing to lose their influence. And they tell themselves, you know what? Maybe what I'm saying is not 100% good, but look how many people came to church. And if I can just keep them here long enough and then get them transformed, then I can preach the real. No, that will never happen. That's you trying to pull people up when they're trying to pull you down. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And we see that in society. You know, the church has the same problems that the world has. Like we should see in the church, we should see a lower divorce rate. We should see a lower suicide rate. We should see a lower rate of problems in families. We don't see any of those things in the church different. They're all exactly the same as in the world. Why? Because the church isn't different to the world. The message in the church is the same message in the world on a lot of these social issues. And that's because Christians these days are not interested in what God has to say. They're interested in what they're doing. And they just want the pastor to rubber stamp it and tell them that they're okay. And they will vote with their feet and with their wallet if the pastor doesn't agree. And so a lot of pastors, they've just learned, I can't talk on those things. But that's not what we're here to do. 
And look what it says. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Verse three, for the time will come. I want to tell you, this is today. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. People will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. Whose desires? Their own. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. You see, they're going to find people that agree with what they're doing because of their own desires. And they're not going to endure sound doctrine. They're not going to listen to someone telling them that what they're doing is not God's plan. So now they're going to find people that are going to rubber stamp what they do and their lifestyle. That's what it says in verse 4. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Notice he's saying to you what? Be watchful in all things, right? That's what we're doing even tonight. We're being watchful of what's going on. Endure afflictions. There'll be affliction on the back end of me doing this message. People don't like it. But you're supposed to endure afflictions. Why? Because afflictions will come. Do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. See, people will do what they want to do. And then they'll look for people to tell them it's okay. And pastors go, awesome, I am here to do that. And you might think, but why? Because if I have to be in a position to tell you what you don't want to hear, that could affect me. And you're going to see this message all through Christian podcasts, all through Christian books, in all of this stuff that you're seeing the changes that are coming in our culture and people are so afraid. You know, in, in Australia, this is not as big an issue, but in America, it's a huge issue. And that's to do with the tax deductibility. So in America, the, you know, because America is still very much a Christian nation, despite what you see on the news, it is still a very moral country and very much a, a Christian nation. The way the tax system is set up is you can become a nonprofit and all the stuff that you give is tax deductible. In Australia, the only real way to get tax deductibility for a church is if they're doing a building program or something like that. But if you just want to give to them like a general offering to help with expenses or with, you know, you know, helping the pastors or whatever, you don't get a tax deduction. But in America, you do. You get a tax deduction for anything really that you give to, to any nonprofit. And so what, what a lot of the government have, have done there is they've just said to churches, and to pastors, you know, if you don't agree with certain things, we're just going to remove your tax deductibility status. If you don't agree with, you know, gay marriage, if you don't agree with trans issues, if you don't do these sorts of things, we'll look to remove your tax deductibility status. And so now a lot of pastors look at us saying, oh my goodness, if they remove that, then a lot of people won't give. Because see, the reason why people are giving, obviously they feel like they need to give, right? They need to give, but they give because they get a tax deduction. It makes them feel better. So they know that if nothing else, they're at least going to lose a portion of their giving because people are going to go, well, if I don't get a tax deduction, I'm not going to give as much. See, the challenge with, with the tax deduction is it's the way that the government keeps a, a, a kind of a, a noose around your neck or shackles around your, your wrists. They'll say, all right, fine, do what you're going to do, but we're going to give you this perk. And we know that people are selfish and they're giving oftentimes motivated for their own reasons. And so it's, it's a way that they can pull you up if you get too far out of line. See, people shouldn't be giving because they get a tax deduction, praise God. They should be giving because they want to partner with what God's doing. Do you want God to be the one that rewards you or do you want the tax office to be the one that rewards you with a tax deduction? It's the wrong motivation. But the government knows the reason why people give and they know that, that this support will, will dry up or at least be reduced. And because of that, they tell them, you don't fall into line. We're going to remove your tax deduction. And the churches just shut up. And this is why a lot of pastors don't speak about these social issues. And as they don't speak about them or speak about them in the way that I've shown you before, you know what happens? The congregation starts to get neutralized and starts to see things in an unbiblical way. And when you start to see things in an unbiblical way, well, now you don't have the ability to live a biblically uh, correct life because the pastor himself is telling you it's kind of okay. Or if you're struggling with it, you know, maybe God's the one that did it. And if I was there, I, you know, I would have told God, hey, look, be a bit more compassionate. But I don't know why God decided to make them male and female. You see, it's, and, and, and it, you know, the shows are good and the lights are good, you know, and the message is great and he's charismatic. You know, in another video he does, he gets out into a boat. He literally sets up like water on the stage and he rows out there in this little boat and he does the message from the boat. And it's cool. I mean, it is cool. 
It's very, very charismatic. It's and, and young people are like, wow, I love going to church because it just feels great. And my pastor has dreadlocks and he wears a cool t-shirt and he wears Air Jordans and, and you know, he's funky. And it's like, yeah, that's great, but the message is going to kill you. And this is the challenge. Again, I'm not against this guy. Please hear my heart. But I'm just pointing it out because it's just such a stark example of biblical basics, like Genesis 1 and 2. And he's like, I don't know why. It's so confusing. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So Jesus, I mean, not it's not Jesus here, but Jesus came and, and it says that Jesus was what? Was what? He was the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And it says that grace and truth came through Jesus. So Jesus is bringing a different type of truth. And this is where I want to share with you a bit about what Jesus was teaching and what I think is the principal message, not just for us tonight, but I believe for us in this culture, for every Christian. And check out Matthew 15, verse 1 says, Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now, you have to understand, in their day, these Pharisees, the religious elders, they were the ones that were considered the holy people. They were the ones that in society people looked to to tell them what was right and what was wrong. People looked to the Pharisees as an example of how to live the life that God wanted them to live under the law. And when Jesus comes along, he makes some statements and comments and does things that are counter to what the religious people of the time uh, uh, were doing. And so they didn't like that. So they, they seek to trap him. So oftentimes they come to him, they pose him these lawyer type questions trying to catch Jesus out. And so in this situation, you know, one of the things that they were supposed to do under the law is there's a ceremonial cleaning, a ceremonial washing of the hands so that you would eat with clean hands. And they're coming to Jesus and saying, how come your disciples don't, don't wash their hands? How come your disciples are doing something that's, you know, not quite against law? And you might think, but what's that got to do with what you're talking about? What that's got to do with what I'm talking about is that you see the culture of their time is seeking to change the truth of God's message. They're coming to him and saying, hey, you're doing this differently. Why is that? And now normally, if it was in our culture, Jesus would be like, guys, please don't misunderstand. Look, there's a reason why, but it's okay. And you know what? If you guys want to wash, you can wash the stuff. And, you know, it's perfectly acceptable. You know, everyone's got a different way of doing it. You know, we're going to do it this way. But, hey, you know, God loves everyone and God is love, right? No, that's not what Jesus does. And that's not what Jesus does pretty much ever, right? Look at Jesus's response. Verse three, he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? Right? Straight away, he's like, oh, it's interesting that you guys pick and choose. Verse 4, for God commanded, saying, honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him put to death. Let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God, then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. In other words, what he's saying is, if you don't do what God's saying in this area, why are you seeking to apply it in this other area? Why do you have different standards? You're coming to me and telling me that I'm doing this thing wrong, but look at the things that you do wrong. And that's because they were being legalistic about it. They weren't understanding the spirit of the law and what the purpose was behind it. And Jesus says that they make the word of God of no effect through their tradition. And that's what we are doing today. We, through our tradition in the church and out of the church, we are making the word of God of no effect. Here's a simple, a simple tradition. If you're in the church and you need help with something, financial, physical, as far as healing, you know, whatever it might be, you're dealing with issues. Where does the church send you? The church sends you out of the church to get help, typically, from people that are not believers. And even if they're believers, they're still not going to use God methods in order to deal with this stuff. 
Well, what's, what does that do? That makes the word of God of no effect. Why? Because the word of God is pregnant, right? It's pregnant with power to help us in our time of need. If you're sick, come and get prayer and get healed. If you've got problems with finances, let God teach you how to manage your finances and also let us help feed you for a period of time so you get back on your feet because that's what it means to be a believer, to help others, right? Like what are you dealing with in your life? Because the gospel has the answer. But we've given that out to the world. And even if you come in the church, that's a tradition. Now, we think of traditions like we wear funny robes and we do all these rituals. No, no, no. It's the tradition of not seeing the word of God as the answer to our problems. It's the tradition of the church giving the responsibility for how to deal with the culture and the situation that we're living in today to the world. It's saying, no, 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 politicians, you tell us what's right and wrong. You make laws, and we're going to say that the laws are what's right and wrong instead of saying, what does God say? Because do you know that sometimes, guys, something can be moral, but it's not legal. Something can be, can be moral, and it's not legal. And other times, something can be legal, but it's not moral. And so if you use the laws of the land to determine what is moral or not, then you're going to be very much subjected to what the culture around you believes. And if you live in a post-Christian nation, which most people do, then the laws of the land in many cases are going to reflect the views of unbelievers. And so therefore, you as a Christian are looking at the laws of the land and saying, well, if that's what the law says, then that must be okay. That's not how it works. And this is a reason why Christians will be persecuted. They'll be persecuted for the exact reason of what Timothy was saying, that people have their own desires, and now they want people that are going to agree with them. And now if you don't agree with them, what do you do? They're going to cast you out. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to call you the same things they call Jesus. And so what Jesus is saying to these Pharisees and these teachers of the law is, hey, you need to have the right perspective and the right heart behind it. Look what he says here in verse 7, hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? Someone that says one thing but does another. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me and in vain they worship me. Watch this, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Teaching as doctrines, in other words, saying that this is what God believes about this or this is what God is saying about this. And then Jesus starts to explain to them why this is the case. Verse 10, when he had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. Then his disciples came and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? It's like, yes. (laughs) But he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. What's he saying? He's saying these people aren't from God. Just because these people look like they're from God, it doesn't mean they are. That's why he he says that every plant will be uprooted. He says, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. Well, what does that mean, blind leaders of the blind? And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a ditch. You can have pastors that are blind leaders to a blind congregation. And the reason the pastors are blind is because they're doing what seems right in their own eyes. And the reason the congregation is blind is because they're following the blind leaders and they're both going to fall into a ditch. And this is why I always say to you, and and I've said from the start, why do you believe what you believe? Don't worry about what I believe. Everything I believe, I need to back up with scripture. If I can't show you in scripture why I believe what I believe, then you shouldn't be listening to me, right? And if what I show you in scripture is different to what you believe, then you might want to consider that you have to change your belief system, right? The Bible is the standard, not us and not our experience and not how we feel. And and the challenge we have is that we have traditions and doctrines that have been taught that are the commandments of men, but they've been taught within the church context and within the, the Christian message, I'll call it, quote unquote Christian message, as being doctrine from God when it's not. And that's why the the, the stats within the church are the same stats outside of the church. It's because they've been taught the same stuff that the culture teaches, the society teaches, as if God's okay with it. 
Verse 15, then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. Like, what do you mean that it's not what goes in that defiles? Because remember, everything about the Jewish culture up until that point was all about the action. You couldn't eat certain foods that was given, you know, was a sacrifice to idol. You couldn't eat pork. You couldn't eat all these things because defilement back then was everything that came from outside in, right? And they're like, that, this doesn't make sense. And look at Jesus, verse 16. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? He's talking about a, a physical principle versus a spiritual principle. What you eat goes in your mouth and then gets eliminated as waste. Verse 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. You see, one thing that goes in through your mouth goes to your stomach. But the things that go through your eyes, right? We talked before about your eye being single. The things that go through your eyes, through your ears, through your, through your understanding, where do they go? They go into the heart. And that's what defiles you. Those things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. What he's talking about is your focus needs to be on your heart and not on your actions. If you have the right heart, if your eye is single, if the things you're putting into you, if the water that you're pouring into that cup is clean, over a period of time, you're going to see the right way and good things are going to come out from you. But if you keep putting in those negative things, then all that's going to come out is what you've been putting in. And if what you're putting in is darkness, then what's going to come out is darkness. And the challenge is that in our society now, it's getting very, very difficult. And I believe will become increasingly more difficult to differentiate between the darkness and the light, even within our church context. Because over a period of time, culture creeps in more and more. And people will allow these doctrines to become commandments of men. This is why there's certain church, um, I'll call them denominations in Australia, that are totally on board with the LGBTQI plus message. Why? Since when is that a church thing? And yet they will say that that's okay and that God loves everyone and God accepts everyone. That's not what the Bible says. God loves everyone, but he doesn't agree with what you're doing. And God makes it very clear that some things are good and some things are not, and some things are going to hurt you. And so even though we're not here to condemn people, we're also not here to rub a stamp what everybody does and tell them that God's okay with it. Because here's the challenge. If you love someone, you will tell them the things that are destroying their lives and you will try and help them out of it. But if you're not willing to speak the truth in love, but the truth, then you're letting people go in the wrong direction in order for you to save yourself. And unfortunately, many Christians hide behind this. Oh, well, I don't want to say that because it's going to upset them. Okay, that's fine. I understand that. But then what's your motivation? That would be like someone that's a drug addict that's struggling to get clean. And you can see they're, you know, they've overdosed maybe. They're, they're living on the streets. They're, they're, they're going through all sorts of problems. And you're like, well, you know, I don't want to get them help because they haven't asked for it. Or I don't really want to intervene because, I mean, everyone's got their own free will and their own free choice. It's like they're destroying their life. And you don't want to intervene. And oftentimes, we don't want to intervene in things. We don't want to tell people things because we're so worried that they'll be offended. But you know what that is? That's just self-preservation. You've made it all about you instead of making it about them. Instead of actually loving them. Because again, love is not a feeling. People don't get this. Love is not a feeling. Love is a verb. Right? Look at the definition of love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not self-seeking. Right? All this stuff. Love has nothing to do with you. <laughs> Nothing to do with love. Love has nothing to do with you. Nothing to do with how you feel. Love is all about displaying the attributes and characteristics of God to somebody else. That's what love is. And so when that pastor says, I'm not saying you haven't found love, that just shows that he doesn't understand what love is. And if you don't understand what love is, then how do you understand the character of God? Because the very nature of God is love. But if you're looking at that as a feeling, then every time God does something that you don't agree with, or you're reading something in your scripture that doesn't seem like love in what you would constitute love, then it becomes confusing. And that's what he said. You heard it from him. He's like, I don't know why it's like this. I'm confused. I don't have an answer. Yeah, because you don't get 
what this whole thing is about. And so now when people come to you and seeking an answer, you don't know how to respond because you don't understand the basis of it. And this is why, brothers and sisters, you have to read your Bible and know why you believe what you believe, because the culture is changing. Our churches are changing. The very institutions that people relied on for almost 2,000 years to at least be the one in society that says this is right and this is wrong, even that is being lost. And I shudder to think what another one, two or three generations of this will look like. Because we at least, you know, have not had this for that long. I mean, it's been maybe five or 10 years. And you look at how radical the change has been. But imagine how it's going to be when our kids and our kids' kids and our great-grandkids have been fed this kind of doctrine. They're going to be completely confused about what the Word of God says. And, you know, the, the one thing that I walk away with this is I go... Thank God that, 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 that we've been told that the Bible will not pass away. The word will not pass away. And so truth will still exist, but just people won't want to hear it. And so this is why, you know, when I watch stuff like this and I think about this stuff and, and what to share with you, I just, I'm telling you from my heart, you have to get serious about this gospel. Because if you're not serious about it, if you don't do your own study, if you don't fill your own heart with it, the world and even the church in many instances is going to tell you what to believe and it's going to be different to what God tells you. Am I saying this guy's a bad guy? I'm not saying he's a bad guy. Am I saying don't go to church? I am not saying that at all. Go to church. But I'm saying keep your eyes wide open and listen to what's being said. Don't just be a sponge and absorb everything, right? We're supposed to test the spirits. We're supposed to be thinking about what we're hearing and we're supposed to go back to the word and say, is that what really God's saying? And we need to be like the word said before, we need to be ready in season and out of season. Because if you're going to be the salt and the light, if you're going to be the one that stands out and represents Jesus as an ambassador of the kingdom, you need to know the reasons why God is doing what he's doing. And so I just want to encourage you, you know, even the stuff that we've shared in the last couple of weeks where Jesus talks about this is the kingdom of heaven. This is, you know, this parable, that parable, this is how this works. This is how God thinks about things. These are key messages because they help you to see the way that God sees. They help you to put on those spiritual glasses so that you can perceive and understand the world the way that God intended, not the way the culture is telling you. And then as you do that, you will, you will grow up into him. You will grow up reflecting him. And when problems come, when issues arise, when challenges come, you can respond like Jesus responded, not like the world responds. You can get to the heart of the matter as opposed to the surface issue. And then people will just get confused because you can't offer them anything. Just like we heard before. I don't know what to do. I can't help you. I can just believe with you. Believe what? Stand with you and pray. Pray for what? You can't pray for something that God's against. That doesn't work. And if you're the one they're coming to for help and you don't know, well, what do you do? And brothers and sisters, all of us are representing Jesus and God equally in, in this on this call. It's not just me. It's all of you. And so when you represent God uh, to the people around you, you need to give them an answer. Be ready in season and out of season. Okay? It's not about just putting it off on someone else and saying that, you know, it's up to God. Let me share with you one more thing just quickly. Notice every plant which my father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. And what I mean by this is this. Oftentimes, we'll hear a message like this or we'll see something we don't agree with and we get all this consternation, okay? And you know, we should do something and we should speak out against them. No, it's not our job to go and criticize people, but it is our job to be ready to help when those people that have been lied to, that have been led astray, eventually reality and life is going to hit them. And that's when we need to be gentle and kind and be available and need to have a solution. You know, oftentimes... You know, the people that are going to listen to a message like this are people that have been through the religious stuff, right? The reason why you're here, most of you, you're not new Christians. You've been through this stuff and you want something real. You want to see what God is really like. You don't want just another message that maybe makes you feel good in the moment, but there's no answer. And so on the one hand, I think it's really, really sad that the, the state of our faith has gone where it's gone. But I'm also incredibly optimistic for the future because it says that the harvest is plentiful yet the laborers are few. And all of us on this call, all of us are co-laborers together in the kingdom. You are ambassadors, you are co-laborers, and we're all doing the same thing. And so the harvest is plentiful because a lot of these people over a period of time are going to run into issues and they're going to still be looking for God because guess what? We all have a God-shaped hole in our heart, amen? We're all seeking 
to connect with God. And if we got, can't find him through, you know, these different messages, we're not going to stop looking, but we're just going to be disappointed. And how beautiful it is when you can share the true gospel with someone to show them what the love of God is, to show them the goodness of God, to be able to lay hands on the sick and see them recover, to be able to give someone a, a, a warm meal and a blanket rather than just tell them to be warmed and filled. To literally be the hands and feet of Jesus because he works with us, brothers and sisters. But in order to do all of that stuff, we have to guard our heart. We have to guard what goes inside us. We have to watch what we watch. We have to listen to what we listen to. Don't be ignorant. Don't assume that just because it's got a Christian label on it, it's good. That just because it's a Christian song, that, that yeah. it's, it's going to be godly. Just because it's a Christian movie or just because it's an actor that, you know, maybe is a... No. Go back and look. What does it say? And the more time that you spend filling your mind and your heart with the things that are not just opposite what God says, but even just the things of this world, you're going to gravitate more towards what people say than what God says. And then just like this young pastor, you're going to be confused. And when the confrontation comes, when the persecution comes, when the heat gets turned up, that's when you see what people are made of. And so I just want to encourage you, guard your heart. If your eye is good, then your whole body will be good. Make sure that over this next week, be deliberate about keeping your eye good. And when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart, and he will make a decision to go, you know what, God, I'm going to keep my eye good. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to take that in. I'm just going to cut it off right there because I want to honor you and then change to something else that is going to be good, that is going to give you the message that's in the scripture so that you can grow up into him and represent him like the true ambassador that we are called to be. Amen.